All right, so let's finish up discussion of parsing and then briefly talk about pragmatics and drawing inferences in language. So some additional evidence that we have from cognitive neuroscience of how we've resolved ambiguity uh, comes from work on the N400 ERP waveform. So we call it an N400 because it is a negative waveform that starts about 400 milliseconds after a stimulus is presented, and it's often used to indicate a mismatch between the meaning of a word and its context. We also find the context text mismatches that are based on world knowledge also produce these. So if I say something like the widow's wife stood next to her, um, widow in this case, um, and having a wife, widow implies that the wife is that the wife is dead. But if the wife is standing next to the widow, that doesn't make any sense. It's a case where we have a mismatch based on our knowledge. And so this would actually fit with the constraint-based theories because according to the constraint-based theories, all possible knowledge is available early on. So now we're gonna talk about pragmatics. So when we talk about parsing, we're talking about trying to figure out a syntactical structure based on what we're reading or based on um, based on what we're hearing somebody else say. When we're talking about pragmatics, we're talking about actual conversations that we are beginning to have with people and trying to get the underlying meaning. So pragmatics are relating to the intended meaning, not the literal meaning. So we're spending a lot of time talking about figurative language. So this will include language that is not meant to be taken literally. So for example, if I'm like, <laughs> good job, um, I don't actually mean good job. And somebody who has a really good sense of pragmatics is going to understand that, no, I don't actually think you did a good job. I'm being sarcastic. So that would include things like sarcasm and potentially snark. Um, and it also includes metaphor. So there is a standard pragmatic model to getting the underlying meaning of an utterance. And this happens in three different stages. So first, we're going to access the literal meaning. We're going to check and see if the literal meaning makes sense in context. And finally, we're going to try to search for a non-literal meaning that fits the context. This feels like a pretty straightforward um, way of figuring out uh, how to process whether something should be taken literally or not. Now, whether or not this is what the data actually show is another matter. We don't do this. We don't do this at all. Um, we actually find that when we are processing non-literal language or figurative language, there's actually competition between the literal and the non-literal meaning. So if I say my surgeon is a butcher, do I actually mean that my surgeon um, works in a butcher shop and is busy hacking up meat? Or do I mean that my surgeon um, is not a very good surgeon, he doesn't really have a very delicate hand, or, um, or um, my cuts, like the stitches take a while to heal, um, my surgeon is very ham-fisted. Um, now, according to the standard uh, pragmatic model, I should eventually come to the fact that the second one is correct. But when we look at uh, the data, we're actually processing both of those meanings at the same time. So here we are looking at data adapted from Glucksberg 2003. Participants were presented with statements that were literally false, scrambled metaphors, or metaphors. And you'll kind of notice that for metaphors, the reaction time to actually process the true meaning is massive compared to these other options, indicating that there is some competition between the literal and non-literal meaning of an utterance. So the standard pragmatic model, as, as nice as it is, isn't, isn't what we do. So this is where the role of conversation comes into play. So I kind of talked about this last week. Monologuing, when you're planning what you want to say to people, um, is pretty easy because you're not actually interacting or playing off of somebody's utterances. When you are having a dialogue, with somebody, language processing becomes more complex because you have to parse what they say, take it in, listen, plan for what you want to say 
based off of what they said and then actually say that thing. So you're constantly in this interactive context. So when we are in conversation with other people, um, we tend to conform to what is referred to as the cooperativeness principle. We work together to ensure mutual understanding. We have to operate with shared knowledge and beliefs, common ground. I don't assume that you know what I know, and I'm going to work to make sure that you are situated in that before I start hitting you up with things that you may not understand. Now, if I'm sharing information with you, or I'm operating under the assumption that you know what I know, but you don't. So I start doing inside jokes that I have with people that you don't get. That is what is called an egocentric bias. I'm assuming everybody knows what I know instead of assuming maybe you don't know that. So I'm going to try to get you situated so that we can interact with each other on that common ground. Um, generally, listeners and speakers um, are going to try their best to refer to that information in that common ground. But sometimes we're going to be egocentric, some of us more than others. Um, keeping on common ground can be really effortful. So Kazar and colleagues back in 2000 actually found that we tend to use a very rapid, automatic, uh, egocentric heuristic. We assume that other people know what we know. And this is what is called ungrounded information. It's information that I know that you don't necessarily know. Um, so we will often, with an egocentric bias, um, be considering only our perspective. Hi, Smedley. Hi, buddy. Come flop. Say hi to the class. Say hi to the class. <laughs> Say hi to the class, buddy. Um, we're only going to consider ungrounded objects from our perspective as potential reference. So common ground is pretty important, uh, but one thing that seems to be uh, considerably more important is consistency. So this actually comes from a study by Chantel and Kazar in 2007. So what you're kind of looking at are instances of um, um, the idea is basically if I refer to something the same way in conversation with you, I should be using it the exact same way all the time. So I should, if I use a certain expression, it should always refer to the same thing and I shouldn't necessarily change that up and create an inconsistency. So here we have, uh, these are eye tracking fixations and you can kind of see that when a new, uh, when something new is presented or when a phrase is used in a new way, creating an inconsistency, um, even when you haven't established common ground. So here we have shared knowledge, thus we have common ground. Here we have no knowledge and thus no common ground. Inconsistency means that listeners are going to take more time uh, focusing on that target. So inconsistency also creates problems uh, when you're trying to figure out what somebody is trying to tell you. So when you're communicating with somebody, even if you share knowledge with them, it's important that you say things and refer to things the same way and be consistent throughout that entire conversation. So finally, we're going to finish up with a discussion of something called uh, discourse processing. So what is discourse? When we, <laughs> he's playing, he wants, he wants you to see his molecule. Um, so discourse is written text or speech that are multiple sentences as length, in length. So, so far with parsing and pragmatics, we've been talking about single sentences. When we're talking about discourse, we're talking about multiple sentences. And the sentences are not as ambiguous here because of context and because we make use of world knowledge. So when you hear... Um, Mary heard the ice cream truck or van coming. She remembered pocket money and she rushed into the house. Now, because we have a lot of world knowledge, we are filling in a lot of the blanks of this information. So she remembers. So first of all, we know that ice cream costs money. So she's going to try to look for her money. She has money. So she's going to run into the house to buy an ice cream. Now, from these three sentences alone, we've managed to fill in a lot of blanks and draw a lot of um, 
implications and inferences. Somebody who doesn't have this knowledge is going to have a harder time dealing with what these sentences mean. So every time that we are dealing with discourse, we are uh, drawing inferences. So we have a few different types of inferences that we can do. Uh, we can do what is called a logical inference, which depends on the meaning of a word. So if somebody who is a widow um, has lost um, a spouse and also is female. So we have somebody who is female who has lost their spouse. Um, and by lost, we mean they have died. Um, we also have what are called bridging inferences. And these are designed to establish coherence between previous text and current text. So for example, if we have something such as Mary poured water on the fire, the fire went out, uh, we are assuming that she... Um, poured water on the fire to put the fire out, and she also knew that the water put out the fire. So the fire being put out was caused by the water. So we're basically trying to do a backwards inference and try to establish coherence to previous text and current text. And then finally, we have what are called elaborative inferences, which are uh, forward acting, whereas bridging inferences are backward acting. Um, and they serve to either embellish or add details uh, to the text. So we're kind of anticipating um, the future. So if you have something like this, um, the director and the cameraman were ready to shoot close-ups when suddenly the actress fell from the 14th story. Odds are pretty good. We're going to assume that that actress is probably dead as a result of that. And it's often called a uh, predictive inference because we're trying to make predictions about what will happen in the future. So how do we draw inferences? So for example, um, what inferences can we kind of draw here? Keith drove to London yesterday. The car kept overheating. So we could probably make the inference that he did manage to get to London, but he probably had some stops on his way there. And additionally, he probably needs to get his car fixed and hopefully he got it fixed while he was in London. Um, now, Gerald, Gerard and Terrace back in 2000 said that there are two different possibilities for how we get these inferences. Um, so first of all, keywords uh, activate related concepts. So drove will activate things related to car, trip, etc. Um, but what's probably more likely is what we see here. Uh, the first sentence creates the overarching context, so Keith drove to London yesterday, and then the second sentence is basically interpreted based on that first sentence. So what's really critical here is that sentence context. So how do we determine which of those is right? Um, one of the ways that we can look at this is looking at uh, eye movements and doing eye tracking. So we have a sentence like this. However, she was disturbed by a loud scream from the back of the class and the pen dropped on the floor. Now, depending on the situation, the sentence uh, that was presented immediately before uh, was either consistent with what was uh, being told or it was inconsistent. So it was preceded by some type of varied sentence and pen was kind of the critical word. Um, so researchers actually found that there was more backward fixation if inconsistent, thus kind of giving claim to the second idea. But the first sentence gives us a context and we basically interpret the second sentence and draw an inference based on that context from the first. Um, but word activation matters too, and so researchers have suggested that uh, discourse processing happens in a phase known as bonding and in resolution. We initially have that activation of words, that first stage, that first possibility, and then we use uh, resolution trying to keep our ultimate interpretation consistent in light with the uh, second possibility of uh, making inferences. Now, let's talk a little bit about what is referred to as anaphor or anaphoric resolution. Fred sold John his lawnmower, and then he sold him his garden hose. So who is the he in this case? I'm assuming you're going to say Fred, but we don't actually know. 
So how do we make these? Uh, this is what's referred to as an anaphoric or an anaphor resolution. So when we're trying to refer to he, who is the he referring to? Is it Fred or John? We are trying to resolve this anaphoric reference. So um, use of gender can occasionally make anaphoric resolution uh, easier. And additionally, we do tend to have an expected pronoun order. So we, we assume that sentences have a parallel construction. So when we say Fred sold John this, and then he sold him this, we're going to assume based on the interpretation of the first phrase that the he must be Fred's. So we have an expected order of pronouns. So he sold him is again in parallel construction with Fred sold John. So the he is Fred, the him is John based on that expected pronoun order. Now, something that kind of fits with this is working memory capacity. If you have high working working memory capacity, um, it's actually been reported that you're likely to notice multiple interpretations and notice areas of ambiguity. And thankfully, uh, context can help constrain those uh, possibilities and help uh, resolve this anaphoric reference. So one of the things that we find with uh, making inferences is um, there are some different models that explain why. Um, and one is referred to as the constructionist approach. Um, so comprehension, according to Bransford and colleagues back in 1972, um, it means that we need active involvement to include information that isn't in the text. For example, the title of the text. So you might remember uh, the famous study that I reported uh, by Bransford and Johnson back in 1972. Um, they had a paragraph that was very, very vague, but was about washing clothes. People who were given the title uh, washing clothes and then given this ambiguous paragraph remembered and understood the paragraph better than people who did not get that title. The title helped create the construction of a mental model and from that mental model you can create inferences and store those in memory as you read and fill out that structure. Um, now, inferences also depend on the goals that we have. Um, if you are reading to understand you are probably going to draw certain types of inferences compared to anticipating future events. Reading for comprehension might include more um, anaphoric resolution. It might require more bridging inferences. Anticipating future events is probably going to include more elaborative inferences. So ultimately, it depends on the goals that you have. Now there is one other hypothesis uh, for uh, discourse processing that we're gonna talk about called the minimalist hypothesis. Um, and this is, was developed by McCoon and Ratcliffe in 1992. So inferences are either gonna be automatically generated without very much processing on our part, or they're gonna be strategic, which means they're goal-directed. Um, some automatic inferences are going to establish what they refer to as local coherence. And what this basically means is that when we're reading a sentence, we can make an inference based off of that um, by drawing immediately on information that is in our working memory. So we're calling it local coherence because we're directly connecting it to something that we've just recently processed, rather than global coherence, which is kind of understanding the whole thing. Um, so some of these automatic inferences, we're connecting to information we've just processed. Um, others are going to, other inferences uh, rely on information readily available because they are in the text. So automatic inferences usually are based on working memory or they're based on the text, um, but more strategic inferences are formed to meet goals. And what's interesting is that most of the inferences that we make, according to McCoon and Ratcliffe, are not while we're trying to understand the sentence, but rather while we recall the sentence or the discourse or what we were trying to say. So what evidence do we actually have for this hypothesis? Um, one of the things that we have found is that whether or not we draw an inference depends on our intentions. 
So this is a really interesting study by Dosher and Corbett back in 1982. So if I give you uh, the sentence, Mary stirred her coffee, um, you're going to assume that she probably had to stir it with something like a spoon. Um, so the idea being that we make this underlying inference that the coffee must have been stirred with a spoon. So Dosher and Corbett reasoned that if we activate the word spoon by presenting the uh, sentence, Mary stirred her coffee, um, if we include the word spoon in a stroop-like task, that uh, if we include the word spoon, that it's actually going to lead to what is referred to as negative priming. So for those who may not know, negative priming is the idea that when something is automatically activated, we have difficulty going back to that immediately. And so once it's been activated, it actually takes us a little extra time to process that again. So if we had spoon on a stroop task, performance for spoon would be worse and it would be slower. So they basically gave people um, two different conditions. They were told to either read it or they basically made them guess what was happening, uh, drawing inferences. So if they got the sentence, Mary stirred her coffee, in a normal reading condition, you're not necessarily going to draw an inference uh, on the word spoon. If you're doing a guessing instruction, you are absolutely going to make the inference that she must have stirred her coffee with a spoon. And so uh, then they gave them this kind of Stroop-like task where they were presented with the word spoon. People with normal reading instructions didn't perform any worse, but people who had to draw the inference that she must have stirred her coffee with a spoon um, ended up performing worse when they saw the word spoon, indicating that um, your intentions affect whether or not you actually draw an inference. Um, additionally, McCoon and Ratcliffe um, did note that local but not overarching inferences are drawn automatically. So we're always making these smaller inferences with respect to working memory. And they did this by presenting people with both uh, text with both local and global goals. Global goals require you to process more of the sentences and draw and think about all of those sentences in possibly long-term memory when you're drawing those inferences. Local inferences only need working memory and thus don't really take a lot of time or effort to do and thus can be done more automatically as a result. So folks, that is all that I had. Thank you so much for a great semester. I, I hope you learned a lot. Um, don't forget that we have some assignments due next week. If you want to get some more extra credit, the extra credit assignment is also due at the end of next week. Thank you so much, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye.